Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kapke, and in this video, we're going to be doing something really exciting. We're going to be learning how to build our very own Delta Live Table Pipeline. But before I jump in, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You get direct access to me, specialized content, live meetings, and more. Now I'm right into Databricks this time. We're going to demo this out. But as always, there's a lot of things to bear in mind. I will put links in the description of this video to everything I'll show you because these are really standard notebooks. They're not my own, but there's a lot to talk about in them that isn't being talked about. So it'll be good to follow through with that. First point before I get into my demos is that Delta Live Table Notebooks, which is a strange thing when you first get in because you're like, Ron, I want to try this out, but you can't. You have to put it through this ingestion engine, which kind of parses it and figures out what you're trying to do. And then it fills the pipeline. Now, it's a little weird because I'm reminded of a Saturday Night Live skit way back, if you're old enough to remember, where there's a thing called Shimmer. And they have an argument in the beginning, these two people who are advertising on this commercial it's a flow axe. It's a dessert topping. It's a flow axe. And it's kind of a goofy commercial. But in a way, when you ask, like, is Delta Live Tables a sort of automated, it does everything? Or do you actually have to build a lot with a notebook? And the answer is yes. And that's why it's really kind of a hybrid. I think because of that, it's hard to get your head around it. Despite, you know, everyone kind of glosses over, this is great. This is awesome. I found it kind of challenging just to kind of figure out where one thing begins and the other ends and how you best leverage it. One of the things to start with is just realizing you do not run Delta Live Notebooks directly. Also, you can only use SQL or Python, and you cannot use both in the same notebook. All right, so one language or the other in a given notebook, but you can use multiple notebooks in a single pipeline. Magics, except for like percent MD, maybe a couple, but most magics are not supported. What does that mean? Well, for instance, I like to use the percent run command a lot in normal notebooks, right? Other notebooks where I can say, hey, I want to call that other notebook and it can create functions for me. It can do work for me and I can kind of treat the other notebook as an extension of this notebook. It's a great way to have reusability. You cannot do that with Delta Live Table Notebooks. It requires a premium Databricks workspace. And I'm going to talk more about that because something everybody just sort of skims over is this is a proprietary service and it does cost a little extra money to use it. So I want to talk about that because that may be an issue for some users. I think the key thing to bear in mind is, will you get enough benefit to justify that? And not only does it cost more, but depending on the features you use, you will also pay more. The other thing to know is that when you create a Delta Live table pipeline, it will not just create one cluster. In fact, it creates two. The one you sort of see and interact with is the execution cluster but it also creates another one which is called the maintenance cluster and the job of that maintenance cluster is to do optimizations and vacuum commands on your data set something i encountered that nobody else said but i had it which was it can consume a lot of cpu partly because of that double cluster thing you imagine imagine you had four nodes well guess what there's going to be another four nodes in the maintenance cluster. So you're already up to eight nodes. Hey, wait, you've also got the driver nodes. So now you're up to 10 nodes. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you're like me and you're on a shoestring budget and you're just trying to demo things like this, you're trying to keep things small. Even if you keep it really small, like just a couple of nodes, it's going to end up demanding a lot of core. So when I first tried to do a Delta Live table pipeline, I kept getting an error in the very attempt that said you need to expand the amount of cores available on your quota in Azure to do this. You don't got enough capacity to do this. Now, I don't generally hit that because I'm able to keep things pretty small, but I hit it a lot with this. And several times in a demo I was doing, I had to keep going back and asking Microsoft to expand my quota. Fortunately, it was pretty quick because it looks like it's an automated process. I clicked the link. I said, I need more CPUs. They said, OK. And 10 minutes later, I'm good to go. But bear in mind, it may cost you more, especially if you're really trying to keep things small. With these things in mind, I would say if you're like a really small shop and you're dealing with small data sets and it's not a problem, you know, processing your workloads the way they are, then Delta Live Tables wasn't really designed for you, all right? It's not meant for everything and for everyone. Delta Live Tables solves a problem, which is out of control pipelines and all kinds of stuff that's hard to track and what's the lineage. So it's really good when you're getting into that complexity and you want to offload a lot of that work from your highly skilled developers doing that. You can push it onto Delta Live Table, but there is a cost. Nothing comes for nothing. So let's take a look real quickly here at the cost because I just happen to have a link here. And when you look here, 
you can see that there's three different levels right off the bat. So we have the core photon. Now, all of them use photon, and yet it is disabled by default, which I find a little weird. But photon is a new, highly optimized sort of engine or optimizer within Databricks that does not use the JVM, I believe. And it's all C libraries, super fast. And you get the benefit of that automatically with Delta Live tables. But you have three levels. The first one is DLT core. You can see here it says 20 cents for DBU, Databricks unit, I guess. And then if you go to the higher level, you're going to pay five cents more for a DBU. And then you can go to the advanced and pay 36 cents for DBU. Now, the interesting thing is I was playing around with this. AWS seems to be the cheapest with this. Now, that might be because with AWS, I believe it's licensed separately. So you pay Databricks on one side, but you also have to pay AWS on the other. So it may actually work out different. I'm not really familiar with how the calculations work there. But you can see that I can choose any of these levels. It doesn't seem to affect my price, but I can do it on any of the different workspaces, right? I can say I'm on a standard workspace, not a problem. But when I go to Azure, notice I can't pick the other two anymore. I have to have premium. Also, it looks like my cost went up, right? The higher end is 54 cents for the advanced. And then I can go to Google Cloud and I only have one option. It's the advanced photon, but it's actually cheaper than Azure, according to this. Again, it might have to do with the way, you know, it licenses things and there may be other build back factors involved, but it's good to be aware of that. So I'm on Azure, I'm gonna stick here. And now when you pick these, you get options depending on what you pick. So bear this in mind, because they never talk about this. You don't get everything for nothing, right? So you get all these great things at the top, but if you wanna use CDC, oh no, you have to go to the higher tier. If I wanna do slowly changing dimensions, I have to go to the middle tier at the very least. Ha, ah, but what if I wanna use data quality, those expectations and all those cool things? Then you have to go to the highest tier. So all that data quality stuff that is pretty cool, you're going to pay for it. So if you don't want to pay for it, you have to think a bit. Maybe you don't want to use that. Maybe there's other ways around it. I'm going to use a standard demo, nothing new here, but I hope I'll add a lot of extra value because I'm going to be telling you what's happening, especially when we build the pipeline. But very quickly, this is something, again, links in the description so you can get this yourself. But we're going to read a raw JSON clickstream data into a table, a Delta Live table. We're gonna read those records then and put them into another Delta Live table where we're gonna use expectations, which is how we sort of monitor the quality of our data and create a new table we'll called prepared data in there. And then we're gonna take that and we're gonna run that through to a third layer, which is getting it to like our gold or semantic. So the typical medallion architecture here, all right, use my Boston accent, but your typical, Medallion architecture is bronze, silver, gold. On the bronze level, you're just ingesting the data. Then you take the raw data and you process it, maybe clean it up, and that goes to the next level, which is silver. And then you may want to aggregate it and prepare it so it could be used in a tool like Power BI or Tableau. And that aggregated level is typically called gold or semantic. That's what we're going to do here. Again, some other links for documentation, and I'll put those in the description, but you can find this documentation really easily just by searching on Databricks Delta Live tables. This is a Python notebook, and I'm only going to show you Python today because I want to keep this relatively short, and I'll do a SQL notebook next. First thing we need to do is bring in our Delta Live table library, and that's DLT. So there we go, and it's actually really a package, I believe. Then we're going to bring in our PySpark functions and things that we need there in our types. And again, I can't run this code. I can only look at it. It looks great, right? But you can see, okay, we've got our stuff ready. This, this is the key differentiator so far. And now we're getting into our Delta Live table code. And I wanna kind of work my way around here. We're gonna go right here. What is this? It's a function. Wow. All right, what's the function doing? It's returning a Spark data frame using a read here, Spark read JSON. And it is going to this thing here, the JSON path. So really this is pretty standard stuff, right? We're just gonna say, I've got a function. It's called clickstream underscore raw. And it returns a data frame, which is reading from this path. Great. Well, where's the Delta Live come in? It comes in right here. What is that? Well, what you actually have here is something in Python called a decorator. And I've been dying to do a video on decorators for a while, so stay tuned for those. But decorators are functions which take functions as an argument. And what they really do is allow you to take a function and extend it. So it takes it in as a parameter, and then it does other things. But the syntax of using a decorator like this makes it look a lot better and you don't have to have ugly syntax of like a function passing in another function it looks kind of messy right so instead 
you have this at sign and then you call in your decorator. In this case, it's a package it looks like. So we're calling in the create table under DLT and that function is actually going to take this function as a parameter. And that's the way it's plugging itself into the Delta Live framework. Now, if you've used Django, then you've seen this kind of thing because Django uses these all over the place. And decorators are also heavily used in Airflow and a lot of other things where you need to kind of hook something into a larger framework because it's very seamless. So meanwhile, back to our story. So we're creating a Delta Live table and we're saying create table here. So this is a very specific function name and it's telling Delta Live Tables Pipeline Builder, I want to create a Delta Live table. here. And this is just a comment. There's a bunch of parameters, but this is keeping it real simple. A requirement of creating a Delta Live table is you must return a data frame, must return a Spark data frame, right? So we'd be turning our data frame here. We've met the requirements, very simple. It's just gonna go out here and read in that JSON file and pass it in here, which will then become a Delta Live table. Pretty easy. Now, bear in mind a couple of things. One is the function name becomes the table name. Does it have to be, can I change it to something else? Yes, you can. But by default, without using the name parameter, it's going to use the function name. So that works and it's pretty simple here. We're just gonna call the table click stream underscore raw. We're gonna take that data that we just created above here, remember that name, because you're going to see it here. We're gonna take that table and feed it into the next layer, which is our silver layer. We're going to be creating a table called clickstream underscore prepare. And the input to that is here, DLT read. So it's, notice DLT, what is that? Delta Live table. So it's reading another Delta Live table, the one we just defined above, and here's the name, great. It's gonna do a few other things though, because this is kind of fancy. It's going to use a with column to rename and cast n as int. So what it's going to do here is cast the column coming in n as an integer, and the column will be called click underscore count. It's also going to rename cur title to current page title, prev title to previous page title, and then it's going to just pick those columns under the new names, and voila, we have a beautiful data frame suitable for framing. Great. Let's look at the delta table part. We have this at table again, right? At DLT table, a little comment, just like before. But we've got a couple of extra things. We've got expectation. These are pretty cool because what expectations do is we can qualify the data or make requirements of the data. For instance, we want to make sure that the current page title is not null. So here's our rule. Current page title is not null. Pretty self-explanatory. But this actually, this part is actually syntax. It's specific. This is just the description you give it, but it's going to use that description as unique identifier for this particular expectation. And you can see it in your log and stuff, so you can see what happened. The other thing we're gonna set as an expectation is that the valid count, and the click count must be greater than zero. Now notice the expectation here just says, expect, nothing else. Well, it's expecting it, but it may not get it. That's what it says there. But expect or fail says, look, either this matches this, either this is greater than zero, or I'm gonna fail the load. The other option I have is I could drop the row. Currently, there's no option to quarantine it, really. It'd be nice if you could say, okay, any rows that don't meet my criteria, you know, here's a table over here I'm defining, put them in there, and I can look at them later. But uh, currently, it doesn't have that. So that's it. This is going to create our second table in the pipeline. Its source is our first table in the pipeline, clickstream underscore raw. And let's go on to the gold layer. The gold layer, we're going to create something. I mentioned it's aggregated. So in this case, we want to get the top spark referrers that's the table we're going to be looking at we're going to be using the step just above we're going to be using the table we just created click stream underscore prepared we're going to do a filter here that says the current title must be equal equal so it's going to be equal to a patchy spark we're going to do another add column right previous page title we're going to call it referrer so we're renaming the column we're going to sort descending by the click count we're going to select our columns right there and then we can even limit this we only want the top 10 right so Great. So again, this is coming from Clickstream Prepared. So we have three tables, raw ingested, which goes into Clickstream Prepared, which goes into top Spark Refers. So it's pretty straightforward pipeline, but you can see there's a lot of cool features here and we're not telling it how to do anything. We're just defining what we want. To build our Delta Live Table Pipeline, we need to go to Workflows here. And then you can see Jobs, Job Runs, we need to go to the tab Delta Live Table. In here, we can go to create a pipeline. So we start by giving it a name. We'll call it DLT Pipeline Demo. And notice here we have Core Pro or Advanced. 
We're using the expectations feature, which is part of the advanced. So we need to use advanced to support that. Now you have the option of triggered or continuous. Triggered is really like job scheduled or something like that. Continuous is really meant for like streaming. So we're gonna stick with triggered. Source code, that's where we plug in our notebook. So we click here and we can go to either a repo if it was there, but we have it right here and we're gonna click on that. And you can see it plugged it into our source code. Can we add more notebooks? Could I add five, six? Yeah, just click here, add source code, and you can add more notebooks. But again, each notebook must be either Python or SQL. Now, Scala is not supported, which may seem a little surprising. As I've said in other videos, Scala is becoming less and less the central language on Databricks, and I think SQL and Python clearly are becoming the new ones. All right, destination. Up until recently, all I saw here was Hive Metastore. But you now have Unity Catalog, which is pretty cool. What is Unity Catalog? The bottom line with Unity Catalog is that in the old days, which is last week, but in the old days, each Databricks workspace was sort of its own little silo, right? It's great. You can do a lot, but they didn't really see each other. And there was no sort of central place where you could query all of the data or even query all of the metadata, which is in the high meta store. So each one was kind of its own little world. Unity Catalog is Databricks' solution to that, which is to sort of create one catalog to rule them all, like the golden ring, right? So that's what that's about. It's in preview. I'm not going to select it right now, but it's an option. Now, storage location is pretty cool. By default, it will store it on Databricks file system, DBFS, and it will find a place for it. But I can tell it where I want it here if I'd like. And mind you, if you're trying to do like, uh, you know, Azure Key Vault and a lot of other things, there's more to the picture than just plugging in a name, obviously. Now, the target schema, really schema. Now, schema and databases are both supported, but this is basically just setting up where you want it to go. And you can see here, if you highlight, it tells you, you know, where do you want to put this? Now, it says schema here, but then it says target database. Here, I'll call it DLT demo, say YouTube, because it's YouTube, right? So I think I got that right. And what that means is I can then easily just say, use that in my SQL if I want and query the tables so I can find them together. Cluster policy, I'm going to leave that as it is. And I can pick a bunch of different options, right? I can use the enhanced auto scaling. So a great feature of the Delta Live table engine is that it will do a lot of that work, auto scaling and making sure your cluster sizes are just right and optimized and yada, yada, yada. And that's the enhanced auto scale. If you don't want that, you can go with the legacy auto scaling. Or if you're really cheap like me and you want to get it down to a single driver node, you can click on fixed size. And this is the only place where I found you can actually get away with setting zero workers, which means I'm going to do this all on the driver node. I'll click on use photon acceleration and I can put some tags here if I like. I could also add notifications and that lets me basically put emails I want. If I go in there, you'll see here, I can say on success, failure, all this stuff. And I really love having that, to be honest. It's a great feature. However, you may have problems in some companies where it goes to the spam folder, or they may have rules even saying you can't just email things to people. Now we got a configuration. I want to just show you this because if you said, I want to pass some parameters into this particular Delta Live Table pipeline, you can do it here. Can I do it other ways? Yes. Yes, you can. You can, you can actually edit the JSON directly after it's created, or if using the REST API, Nice thing about Delta Live Tables is you can do all of this through their REST API. So if you're using maybe some sort of meta data driven framework and you want to generate it with the REST API, it works. I'm really psyched they did that because they could have kind of skipped that and said, we'll do it later. And if you haven't seen this before, you have the current and the preview channel. So if I wanted to use some really slick new thing, and I don't know if above here, I would need to do that if I want to use the Unity catalog, that might only be in the preview channel. But I'm not using it. I'm going to stick with the safe and proven current for now. And I'll just say create. Now, it doesn't do too much yet, but let me take a little tour here. When it does, I'm going to be able to see all these different messages will appear below. And I have an option of development or production. It's defaulting to the development mode. Now, the biggest difference I can see in development versus production is that it's going to have to create a cluster to do this building of your Delta Live Table pipeline. And by default in production, it will throw away that cluster pretty much immediately saying, oh, save your money, get rid of that. But if you're looking to keep it around because you're going to keep trying and failing like I do uh, and see until you get it right, you might want to keep it around. So the nice thing in development is it will keep that cluster that you're using for DLT around for a while. There's some other, I think, niceties there. Get to that maybe another video, but that's that's the biggest difference. So when you're ready to go to production, you can just flip that mode around. If I want to delete this, I can do that there. I can set permissions. And we're going to take a look at settings in a minute. That's kind of a cool place where I can change different parts of this and, of course, my schedule. But I want to just kind of jump right in and say, let's start this process. And I may have to go for a cup of coffee while waiting for this to create the cluster. But here we go. 
And I want you to see that it shows you the workflow of what it's doing to build your pipeline. And I think originally, apparently, they didn't have this. But I really like it because, oh, OK, it's, it's started the update. Now it's waiting for a cluster. They call it resources, just to make it sound cooler. But you're waiting for a cluster. But then it's going to start initializing everything. Then it will set up your tables. Once the cluster is created, that's pretty much where you're going to either fish or cut bait. It's either going to work and you're going to be like, rah, <laughs> or you're going to hit some bugs. You'll see a little red line at the bottom when there's a bug created. And then you click on it and, oh, OK, there's a syntax error or something like that. The only thing I don't like sometimes about that is it doesn't pop up in your face and say, hey, it doesn't work. You don't see anything on the main screen. So you have to keep an eye on the, uh, the little lines you can see below here going along and what they're doing. But you really won't get any real information until it's past the initialization stage because it's right now it doesn't have a cluster to run. So you can see that it created the pipeline and now it's running it. So you can see the green. It's pretty cool looking, actually. This is the best part because you get to see it started on the left and it's running through now and it's ingesting data into the raw layer. And then you're going to see if it works correctly, it'll kick that in and then build out the prepared layer and then feed the data finally into the gold layer or top Spark refers. I was doing that on the right, too. You can see things. If you scroll up, you see the pipeline. You can see the update te details. You can see how long it's taking, among other things. And you can see here, you can go and see the cluster in the Spark UI. You can go to the logs if you want to look at those. And you can see metrics as well. All right, so now it's completed. And you can see everything is green, so it completed successfully. And you notice, you can click on any one of these descriptions and get an expansion of it. But I wanted to show you also, you can see that as it's doing everything, it's giving you a little message. So this is your DLT log as it's running kind of thing. You can see what it's doing and where. It's even highlighting the diagram above as you go over it. So that's a pretty cool feature. And if I click on any of these tables, I get some metrics here. So I can see here, yeah, this one in particular, you can see like dropped, written. So you get to see the whole thing here. And you can see you know, our validation. You can get the schema. And so each layer gives you information. So that's pretty cool. But another thing I want to show you is that I can go into settings. And you see all this here. But let me shrink the screen a little bit. And you can see that I can go into JSON. This JSON was built based on my settings and based on the input. So you can see here it, it creates an ID, a unique identifier for my DLT job. And then you see the cluster definition here. And a lot of JSON, things like that. And I can also create configuration settings I could put directly into this. So if I wanted to pass parameters, things like that. Now, you can directly edit the JSON. In fact, you could, you could do most of it through the JSON if you want. One thing I'll also point out is that here you see it says libraries and notebooks. But libraries just means the notebooks that are creating your DLT. That's not like your Python libraries or something like that. So bear that in mind. And we can also go up to compute. And if I go into compute and then go to job compute, you'll see this is the cluster it created. So it did its own thing and created a cluster there for me. Now, remember in settings, this is what we created as our database where we're going to store everything, right? So what I want to do now is let's switch context to the database that we created. I want to do a show tables. And we can see from that that, yes, we did get our three tables. That's great. And let me change this. I'll go 10. I want to take a look at 10 rows of Clickstream Raw just to make sure it, it got that. And there it is. It came out great. Looks good. Now I can also do a describe of a table. I can do describe extended, and we can get all the attributes from that. And if I want to see, you know, let's take a look. I like to always take a look at the data, make sure it looks good after I'm done. I didn't get corrupt data, but it looks good here. And finally, we'll do the top refers, and there it is. Looks good. Now, there's a question maybe asking, because I certainly asked myself this question. If I delete a Delta Live table pipeline, does it delete the underlying tables? Now, my intuitive sense would have said yes. However, there's a bit of an alarm with that thought, because, of course, I delete the pipeline. And suppose, you know, there's all these tables, a lot of data in them, and it was a mistake. Oh! So it does not appear to do that. I have deleted pipelines. I have found that the tables still stay there. So the good side is, hey, you won't lose data, I guess. The downside is, though, if you created a lot of stuff and you're especially like me experimenting a lot, you're going to have to go back and clean up after yourself and get rid of those tables when you delete the pipelines. The other thing, to be honest, I, I need to look at better. If you leave the Delta Live Table pipeline lying around, is there any chance that you'll be consuming anything, maybe for the maintenance clusters, even when you're not running it? So like I'm doing demos, I don't know if there's any overhead of running it. 
I can say that it looks like in my bill, I got a little more of a spike than I normally would when I'm running a tiny little cluster on an interactive notebook. So there is that, and you don't have that kind of granular control. I think Delta Live tables are great. I think Databricks is going to keep investing and expanding on the functionality of them, which is why they have my vote to use them. But they do take some getting used to. We're going to do more looking at that later. There's more to it. It's not as simple, you know, go in and just do things. You're going to have to think about what you're doing. I want to thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, and let other people know about my channel. Until next time, I'm Paul Employer. We're all in this together. Thank you.